So, good morning, everybody. Uh, so today, the title of the lecture is the New Borderland Paradigm. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I want to relate it to the earlier discussion of the Cressy concept, which I see as an old Borderlands paradigm. Because in fact, the essence of the Cressy ideology is that it is a borderland, but uh, of an older type, with this overt Orientalism, uh, overt asymmetries, uh, while what we witness today is the spread of this modern contemporary borderlands idea, which, which by the way, the, this very school is a, a also a place of uh, promotion, <laughs> reproduction and study. And uh, I would propose a rather critical view on this, what I call ideology or paradigm or discourse of new borderlands. And my main, my main case studies were regions of Poland, especially Eastern Poland, uh, in which I was trying to see how the regional authorities are trying to develop new institutionalized uh, identities. And in almost all cases, this notion of borderland one, one was central. Uh, and of course, it's not the, the, these were not the local ideas, not that those local intellectuals or officials suddenly discovered the notion of borderland, but this is a much broader fashion, uh, one which we are all element of, and uh, uh, this is an element of the diffusion of innovation, mostly from the Western core to the Eastern European peripheral areas, uh, and I started to reflect on functions of the, this new borderland ideology. And I came with several rather critical uh, uh, conclusions, which I wanted to share with you. Uh, maybe some of them go too far, so please respond, uh, challenge or comment. Uh, uh, I'll be trying to be a bit provocative uh, with this critical uh, view. and. Uh, and my basic uh, perception is that this new borderland paradigm basically legitimizes inequalities, domination, and all, all those center periphery things. And again, very simple message is that borderlands are usually peripheries. But borderland is a politically correct way of currently of naming, labeling uh, 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 peripheries because the borderland does not emphasize inequality, but it's based on a supposed equality and all those politically correct ideas of mutual respect, uh, uh, exchange, communication, uh, 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 etc., etc. Uh, uh, <coughs> why I would uh, uh, argue that from an analytical point of view, notion of peripheries and all those related theories of center periphery, including closed system theory, but there are several other approaches to dependency. Uh, much more useful in sense of analytical uh, efficiency of pointing to really existing mechanism of uh, social hierarchies uh, simply to un understanding, they allow understanding what is happening in, in those marginal dominated regions. Why borderland, idea of the borderland is a normative one. It rather sets a certain goal, social, uh, political sometimes idea, rather than describes a really existing uh, uh, reality. Uh, and, the key, and the key difference is this relationship of power, which Peripheries, the notion of peripheries rests on the notion of power, while borderlands marginalizes power. Power doesn't exist, we can all have our different identities, we can speak our languages, we can think whatever we want, and no one is more important than uh, another person, which is, as I would say, usually not true. Uh, and especially if you want to understand what is happening in specific regions, we have to take into account the relations of uh, 
of power. Uh, and also understand that identities usually are not a subject of free choice, but are structurally defined and, and, and the, the, the choice of identities, even if it's more or less available to specific people and agents, it has its costs. And uh, I uh, want to, I already mentioned Stein Rokan, the famous Norwegian political scientist, uh, which is another theorist which can be seen as uh, this those, uh, dependence type theorist. Uh, uh, so, so Rokan is famous for his theory of cleavages, political cleavages, but also of this, for this uh, typology of peripheries. And, uh, and as you can see, he singled out four external enclaves, felt centers, and, uh, and interface peripheries. And I think this, this last category of interface peripheries, which, is, which are peripheries where influences of at least two external centers uh, uh, overlap, is, 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 is most important. And basically, it's, uh, it's a synonym of borderlands. Uh, and uh, especially, this is a synonym of uh, positively, optimistically uh, seen borderland. A borderland where there's some uh, uh, perspective for development. And this development, as I would see it following Rokan, is usually related to some kind of a competition of those, between those external centers who offer, uh, uh, offer different uh, perspectives which are uh, part of a competition of, uh, between between those two external centers who, which try to attract a given periphery to its own zone of uh, influence. And this competition can have different di dimensions. The, in fact, uh, Rokan was uh, identifying dimensions similar to Pierre Bourdieu, so economic, political, cultural. Uh, those three basic dimensions in which this, all these processes can take place, especially this competition and de dependence. So sometimes all those three dimensions are strongly related and sometimes uh, autonomous. Uh, uh, as for example, the, the case of 19th century Poland had this specific situation when there, there was no Polish state, but there was a Polish economic domination over what Cressy uh, once was, uh, and also cultural, Polish cultural domination, uh, uh, and at the same time, no, no, no political uh, uh, de de dependence on, on Poland, which didn't exist. Uh, so I think that this is the, 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 the two key notions are this interface peripheries and external peripheries. And this is, this is the, the, the most important distinction. External peripheries, that is, those which are dominated by a single center, single core, and which usually are the real limit, that is, the, after they end, nothing else exists. So, so the typical external peripheries are those in, uh, in an RES uh, located on the uh, banks of uh, rivers, uh, uh, oceans, uh, uh, seas or some no man's land. Uh, uh, so you you can say in Northern Europe is, is external periphery, or, or or Portugal is external periphery of uh, 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 of Europe. Uh, uh, while uh, while Rockan argued that uh, several cases of. A, of uh, interface peripheries, which are extremely successful. And he suggested that this belt, this famous belt, which I pointed uh, uh, to, I think, at the, in, during the first lecture, this blue banana, this area starting with, with Netherlands in the north and going up to uh, northern Italy, is to some extent can be interpreted as an interface periphery, especially those smaller states like Luxembourg, Switzerland, with its cantons and Benelux countries, which are, which are tiny in the political terms, but very successful in terms of uh, economic and cultural 
in development can be seen as, as interface peripheries because they were always and still are objects of competing influences, especially of France and Germany, sometimes, sometimes England, now United States, too, several, several uh, external actors, and they are able to benefit from this cross-cutting uh, influences. And another classic example of, of, of interface periphery is the, 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 the case of Finland, which, which, which we already uh, mentioned. As I said, the, this is this famous uh, Finnish geographer Pass, Passi, like analyze Finland in, in this, this terms, that this is an interface between Western and uh, Russian Soviet uh, influences, and one which is able to take uh, this uh, profit from, from this uh, specific uh, uh, location. And one can also think about, I think, most countries of, of, of Central and Eastern Europe in terms of interface peripheries. I think that Poland is a classical case of interface periphery, but in a historical long-term perspective. And it was most visible during communist time, uh, when Poland was the so-called freest uh, barrack of the communist camp, uh, uh, and especially during the 60s, when it was developing quite uh, uh, dynamically, and when in the 60s and 70s, for example, Polish culture was quite uh, popular in the entire Soviet Union. Uh, because I think the Poland was this interface periphery, where the Western countries were trying to attract Poland to its zone of influence, and they were investing and, uh, and uh, sending intellectuals and offering scholarships, and, and there, 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 there were a lot of uh, opportunities for Polish scholars, for Polish artists, and at the same time, the, the same people could travel to the Soviet, Soviet Union, and they uh, uh, works uh, enjoyed popularity in the uh, Soviet Union. The entire generation of the Soviet intelligentsia of the 60s knew Polish. When I meet those old people in the Russia and other countries, they often say, ah, I, 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 I. when I was young, I was learning Polish. I was watching Polish films, Polish reading, Polish journals. And this was, I think, the, the classical moment when this interface status of Poland was extremely well uh, uh, visible, but but I think the emergence of of most of other of, of the countries of the, of the region can be attributed to this competition between the especially within Russia, Soviet Union, Russian Empire, and the broadly understood West. The support German, especially German support for the smaller nation states in the in the late 19th century and and and, and later. These are the processes of classical competition between the between the in this case German uh, uh, imperial uh, and then just simply Western uh, uh, <coughs> uh, center of power and and, and the Russian uh, center Ru Russian uh, uh, core. Uh, but uh, no politically correct. Uh, interpretation of this status is now borderland status. I think this was the uh, Timothy Snyder book, this borderlands, uh, yes, uh, about the history of the of the region, where, 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 where in fact he suggested this entire region is a borderland. While I would say this uh, much more uh, uh, adequate notion would be uh, peripheries. So, so borderland is extremely arbitrary. Of course, peripheries are also arbitrary, but uh, but well, you can I think this dependence that which defines peripherality can be measured easier than this notion of borderland status, because if there is economic dependence, it's quite easily uh, measurable. In fact, cultural dependence is also visible because you can. So measure somehow how many references, how many elements of foreign culture, ideas coming from outside are present in a given region or state. While, but, uh, but there's this question of uh, political incorrectness, and I myself uh, uh, encounter this, this problem 
uh, in Poland. When I'm trying to, to, to talk about Poland as periphery, this is rejected by, by, both by the conservatives and, and by, 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 by the liberals. And this is the same with the regions. When I'm trying to write about Polish regions in terms of peripheries, this is not really enthusiastically accepted. Rather, a minority of local intellectuals get interested in this as a uh, diagnosis, but especially all those related to the local authorities, those who are dominant in terms of power, intellectual, political, reject the notion of peripheries because this, this somehow undermines the whole idea that this is the center of the world, we should be self-confident and we should not talk about our weaknesses because our pride is, uh, for the conservatives, is the idea of the pride, of this idea of self-worth that we should build, strengthen. And the notion of peripheries suggests that we are weak, we, are some, we, we, are, we, we have the complex of inferiority. And for the liberals, it's usually the idea that we should integrate with the outside world and not, not really discuss the inequality of this integration. Uh, so I would call even this borderland discourse uh, a form of politeness. There's, I don't know if you are aware in, the, in, in, in discourse theory, in linguistics, basically, there's a politeness theory, uh, which especially singles out two types of politeness, negative politeness and positive politeness. Uh, and, 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 and they should work uh, together. The, 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 the negative politeness is the, uh, the, 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 the norm that you should give freedom to your interlocutor. And then you should not order, force anyone to do that. So, so you should always ask, would you help me? Would you be so kind? Could you? Instead of, please, or do this. And, 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 and ne negative uh, politeness is this in in inclusion, inclusion into common community, that one should always emphasize that we are in a one social group, that you are not excluded, that you are not someone else, we are all. So people quite often use, instead they should say, I do something, I tell you, I teach you, I, or do you, they said, we, we will now do this exercise, which means I will uh, do something else and you will work. Uh, uh, and I think this is, some, this is exactly those two norms are present in this borderland discourse, that it, 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 it supposedly it emphasizes the su su supposed freedom of peripheral region, regions. You can choose any identity you want, you are free, you are even... Some of those theories of borderlands even say that borderlands are freer than the center, than the core, because in the borderlands you have this multiplicity of identities, this cross-cutting influences, this richness of cultural heritage that anyone can be anyone. Uh, and then there is this, this inclusion that borderlands are uh, also part of our core uh, community. Uh, because per peripheries exclude to some extent. You are periphery, I am a center, you are periphery. This emphasizes this distinction, this, this symbolic border between, between those who have power influence and those who are dependent uh, uh, on it. So from the point of view of this politeness, uh, political correctness, and all the social norms, I, I, I could not question the value of borderlands as, as this discourse, polite uh, discourse. But I think what's important is to make a distinction between uh, uh, academic uh, analytical approach and, and some normative political project. So if a borderland is uh, consciously uh, constructed political project and someone wants to promote it, no, okay, I am not against it, but if someone is a critical, analytically oriented scholar and projects this ideology of borderlands into his research before really uh, identifying the really existing dependencies, internal, external, and all inequalities, I, I am, I am uh, Reserved. I'm. I have uh, uh, my critique of of, of this kind of uh, idealistic assumption. So, so as 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 it seems to me, this borderland discourse rests on several assumptions, including this 
this idea of space, space of flows, uh, this idea of the choice of, uh, of uh, uh, this is related to the space of flows especially. I think it's related to this, uh, this vision of the postmodern world as dramatically, uh, radically different from the older social order which was supposedly based on borders, uh, limits, uh, barriers. And now we live in this open space of flows, open, open borders, especially, you know, this role of the internet, electronic communication is emphasized here as this, 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 this game-changing te technology. And, and, and I'm a bit skeptical about this approach, although there's some... Uh, there's some justice uh, to it because it, 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 it's really much easier to communicate and many borders, especially in the EU, uh, don't really exist as uh, really material barriers. But still there are a lot of borders and, and, and still it's quite difficult to travel for most of uh, people and not always easy to communicate, despite of all this technological uh, uh, progress. and. Uh, and I think this is one of those idealistic, uh, ideological even, uh, assumption. Uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, theses which uh, uh, Mike Savage called epochalism, this idea that uh, which social scientists la la love to produce, this, this models of the old world, old order and new order and this supposed revolution that uh, just happened on is is about to happen like in a year or two and we have to all be ready and 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 even if there's you know some uh, some uh, uh, justification for this radical change i think it's it's not as revolutionary as it seems it means that that that, that we do not live in such an open space and world uh, of flows as as some would like to, and the, another reflection can be added that, that already there have been periods in the global history where there was as much of free flow of ideas, people and capital, especially the so-called first globalization, the late, late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, which by the way, the Kharkiv is a great example of the product of this uh, of this of, of this era of, of 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 largely free flow of uh, ideas. This was a much more cosmopolitan city, and the entire region of Donbas, especially, it was an uh, extremely cosmopolitan uh, culturally area. In contrast, to what it is now, uh, so one can challenge these ideas of this uniqueness of the of the of the of the present day uh, uh, era. And that means also this uniqueness of this new borderland uh, uh, identities which, which emerge or should emerge, which are expected to uh, 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 emerge. There is also an, an important element of this new borderland discourse, especially what, when I see it applied in regions in Poland, that the borderlands have some kind of hidden potential. That that uh, that is usually related to the cultural heritage and this inter intercultural uh, 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 nature, and and I see this as classical culture culturalism, this idea that the culture can produce uh, uh, unexpected dynamic economic growth. That's what what only uh, has to be done is that it should be somehow mobilized or uh, discovered or re, uh, reconstructed. And, uh, and also there's an this, this importance assigned to the spirit of supposed openness, tolerance, uh, uh, characteristic for multicultural uh, regions. So this is again the summary of those, of those pos pos positively defined characteristics of regions seen as borderlands. The, the diverse, tolerant, uh, uh, and this, they have the supposed ability to innovate. Uh, and the, in Polish uh, uh, discourses, 
they are contrasted from time to time to, 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 uh, directly to Cressy. Uh, so this one of the authors said Cressy reached the limit, but, uh, but, but, uh, but, but borderlands don't have uh, any real uh, 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 limits. And, uh, mm, and there is some, sometimes even quite striking comparison. It's not uh, typical, it's, but, uh, but, uh, but, but comes, uh, 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 shows up from time to time in those discourses in Poland, especially comparison of the borderland regions in Poland with the Silicon Valley or other, you know, the, the, the most important cent economic centers of the world and especially in terms of the cultural diversity. So Silicon Valley is known for its diversity, tolerance, uh, and exactly now our peripheral regions, borderlands in Eastern Poland have the same nature characteristics. So it's what only left is to mobilize, to realize it. And, and then you know, in a few years, we can turn those regions into, into this uh, growth poles and maybe reach this uh, status of Silicon Valley's uh, in a decade or two. And I suggested to you as a uh, no, secondary reading uh, this, this uh, fascinating book uh, by German geographer Ul Ulrich Best, a study of the Polish-German border, uh, uh, which I really like because it's a critical discourse analysis of this very optimistic normative discourse of the Polish-German uh, open border and uh, border cooperation, which uh, as best, fully best convincingly uh, argues, hides, marginalizes most of the asymmetries between the German and Polish uh, side. He shows even in all, most of the documents related to this cooperation, there was always uh, some normative assumption of the superiority of everything German and, and this uh, need for, uh, of Poles learning from Germans and, uh, and all kinds of other, uh, other asymmetries. And also he points to the still, really still existing material barriers. Uh, first of all, the simple, simple restriction on travel of people who are lower class and for whom the crossing the border is simply expensive. Uh, or for whom the linguistic barrier is really a, a real problem because they don't speak neither German nor English nor any other foreign uh, 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 language. And what seems uh, a borderless world, and especially in this case, the Polish-German border which physically doesn't exist, seemingly you can cross, you know, uh, this in Frankfurt Subica bridge, you can cross you know, 20 times a day and many people do it. And this is like materially non-existent, but in fact, socially, not only in Frankfurt and Subica, but more generally the entire border uh, region is highly structured, asymmetrical and full of inequalities. Uh, uh, so, 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 so Ulrich, uh, problematizes this as a challenge to the left theory because he is quite engaged politically on the left and he thinks that, that, that this, this, this discourse of the borderlands of this, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this space of flows became part of the this mainstream uh, also academic discourse and it's much more difficult now to criticize the existing barriers because they are largely denied. Once the borders were in place, they were on the maps and, and really existing, and it was, it was easy to point to the, to this, to this, to the barriers. And bar these barriers became uh, less visible, not only physically, but also discursively, because, because part of the large part, even dominant part of the, of, of the academic social science discourse denies them or marginalizes them. They, they roll by by trying to you know, promote e equality, but, uh, but the, the, the side effect is this marginalization of the, uh, of the, the, the lack of the tools to, to study the really existing uh, inequalities. 
And another, my another case study is a critical analysis uh, of my own critical, uh, my own critique of my colleagues sociologists from Warsaw who studied uh, this Eastern, uh, Eastern Polish regions and Poly borderlands, Polish Ukrainian, Belarusian, Ukrainian borderlands. A lot of people in Warsaw and other centers study go to these borderlands and they study this Polish Lithuanian, Polish Belarusian, uh, Ukrainian uh, borderlands. And these, these, especially this was Joanna Kurczewska, a very eminent Polish uh, sociologist. She published several volumes, and uh, and 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 at the core, theoretical core of the of her of a large number of those very interesting studies was this, uh, for me, uh, quite uh, intriguing opposition between the two orientations. She, she, she called them orientation towards the border, orientation towards the borderland. The idea was that the, they were interviewing people living in those uh, border areas and found that, that, that <laughs> unfortunately, major part of them per still perceive in this old-fashioned way border as a limit which they usually don't cross if they don't have any material uh, interest for trading something and they not they are not very interested what is on the other side and they are not interested in the culture of their neighbors you know, the Lithuanians or Ukrainians and whoever is on the other side they are just narrow-minded Polish Catholics uh, who do their small businesses and they, do, they are not interested in the heritage of the regions and especially of this wonderful opportunities, cultural first of all, which are related to the to the to this you know existence of the borderland and in some cases open border, especially with Lithuania. Uh, not so much in, in Ukraine, but still there is there is this possibility, and, and there is always a majority of people who are oriented towards the borderland. So they. Those who know that they live in the borderlands, not in the border region, but in the borderlands. And they are usually intelligentsia members, as I uh, uh, would say. And to me, this was a really not very reflexive projection of the intelligentsia status of the academics on, on the region they were studying. This was to me a quite normative idea that people who live in those villages on the borderland should be like intelligentsia members. They should travel to the other side to participate in you know, cultural events, learn at least some of the language of the of, of the neighbors, study of the neighbors, study history, etc., etc. And then, supposedly, if they engage in all those, all those activities, the region starts you know, developing, booming, and. Uh, and all the peripheriality will be gone because they will mobilize the potential of the of the borderland. And this is to me extremely idealistic. On one side, I am I am myself an extreme <coughs> case of this oriented towards the borderland people. And when I go to the you know, border region, I immediately try to cross the border to learn you know, the, who is speaking which languages, what are the identities. And you know, do engage in all these activities, uh, but 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 I, I would not really expect everyone, especially those local people uh, who I am only visiting, to follow my example and do things which are extremely you know elite uh, and require time, money, and. Uh, uh, like things we do are uh, uh, really a great privilege. Spending several days learning about history theories and spending days walking uh, uh, through you know, those very interesting neighborhoods. Uh, uh, but still, it's not something everyone can and afford, and, and, and especially not everyone can profit really from it. From, from us, it's a kind of investment. If we learn all the things, we can use them later, in our, especially in our economic careers, but wherever, in our social life, probably, we can, we can use the knowledge, the experiences, the, all, all, all this uh, that we learn here. My, most, for most people, it will be you know, most, more or less useless, at least some anecdotes that could, that, 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 that could take from such a trip uh, to Kharkiv, but, uh, but nothing more. So, 
So I was really uh, surprised with this lack of, 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 of self-reflexivity. Of, uh, Jana Kuczewska is my colleague, so, so, uh, so this was not... Uh, this was a kind of a friendly uh, critique, and but I hope that she's not a uh, unusual person. This very, very, very typical attitude, especially of this Warsaw uh, intelligentsia. And the extreme case of this uh, of this attitude or this idea is 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 the case of the uh, center, cultural center Pogranice, that is borderlands in Polish, in Seine. Some of you could uh, hear about it. And, uh, and this is built by uh, one of the typical intelligentsia members, uh, Czewski, Mar Marek Czewski, I think, who is this kind of activist, uh, intelligentsia elite member, who tries to turn uh, Seine, a, a village on the polish Lithuanian borderland, into this cultural hub and engage local uh, uh, inhabitants in all kinds of those activities. But, but, but even in this series of volumes which Kurczewska published, there is a very interesting critical study of Seine. So in this sense, I, I have to admit that Anna Kurczewska was open to different uh, views, even if, if she had this uh, central, quite normative idea. And she shows that, 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 that there are some uh, ambiguities or even tensions in Seine related to this cultural center. That, that a lot of people really don't know who serves, whose interest it serves. Even there are some anti-Semitic uh, attitudes because they promote all the time Jewish culture and Lithuanian culture and some other cultures. And some, uh, I remember in this text, some quotes from the local inhabitants why no Polish culture is promoted in this uh, center. So, so. Uh, so this is not that I would you know, criticize in any way the activity of the center, but, but I think that uh, the problem to me is that, the, that this kind of activity, I think, cannot be seen as the, the only or even the main uh, avenue for development of these peripheral areas. Well, that, but it's uh -huh. an NGO, so I mean, yeah. it's not of that it's like one institution. Yeah, yeah, of course, you know, so I, exactly, but this is what I'm trying to say. that. Everything they do is wonderful and, 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 and of great value, but my problem is with the academic uh, interpretation of the, 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 the use of the activity in the, in the in, in this development of the ideas of the this peripheral region the, you know, development project that 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 I think they, their role is overestimated in the sense that. That the, the, the people in those regions are told once you build this kind of center, like the Seine has, your region will be transformed from a periphery into you know, some kind of a new Silicon Valley. That 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 this is that this is my my problem. That this is that that that, that this kind of borderland studies overestimate the the role of those of those center uh, of this kind of the centers which. Uh, which, which are very valuable, but to large extent they also serve a lot of external uh, you know, visitors, uh, intelligentsia elites, which, which come from, uh, from capitals. This, the, 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 this is quite characteristic that you have the, you know, the people from Warsaw, Berlin, Vilnius, uh, Moscow, all the time invited for seminars, uh, summer schools, and, and dis discussing all those things were uh, like the interaction with the locals it's exist and but but it's it's the, the the benefit for the like for the economy for the for the community is is not so obvious in terms of of, of being uh, radically changing the development perspective because the, the problem for me is that that that, that those theoreticians of borderlands suggest that the, the fate of the region will change with this kind of activity I think this is very valuable, but but one cannot marginalize the economic dependence. The, uh, and, 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 and especially, I think this eastern Poland part of the located on the of the Polish Belarusian borderland is, 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 is a radical example of marginalization of economic problems, especially related 
to the Polish accession to European Union and, 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 and Schengen area. That entry into Schengen area of Poland, which was widely celebrated as you know, the integration of Europe and again, the space of flows, all these ideas, we are now living in this borderless EU world. But the people living on the Polish Belarusian borderland, it meant the closing of the border and, and, the, and the crisis of many of the local businesses and also fina financial you know, bankruptcy of, 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 of several of those businesses. And, and, and I only by visiting Białystok, I learned that in this period there were manifestations in Białystok demanding the opening or not closing of the border. Uh, and I never heard about them in Poland because we had celebrate in Warsaw we had celebration because I was I was free to travel to all the conferences, congresses, scholarships and fellowships, uh, even without need applying long term visa. But for those people on the on, on, on the Belarusian area, this was a real problem because they could no longer continue the they, they small businesses, they trade or or even there was a more serious uh, businesses that simply the trade. There was a furniture business developing in Białystok Korea oriented toward Belarus and much of, of it went bankrupt. Uh, and this is, I, I think, this, this is my problem with the Tuzewski borderland center, etc. That it's important, but it, it cannot be a substitute for, 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 for economic uh, uh, development. Uh, and I think this is the projection of the intelligentsia centered uh, perspective on, on, on those uh, uh, regions. And, and this is a, like I said here, a transformation of geographical divisions into some cl class social divisions that, 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 that you uh, uh, classify people along those lines, border, borderland oriented, but this is in fact a class class classification, you, know, you single out the intelligentsia elite, the positive actors, and those lower classes or even middle class, but with no cultural capital, who, who simply do businesses instead of studying the heritage of the, of the regions. Uh, and so, so there is a strong element of, uh, of, uh, of uh, say, uh, of a message, you know, of uh, of even uh, or not order, but uh, 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 an expectation directed from this elite, the authors of those theories, towards the local inhabitants, that they they need to do all those things. They de they develop those orientations. Uh, and, you know, and change the attitude, start to crossing the border, learning the history. And this is, I think, the, the hidden power of cultural capital, especially in Poland, very visible. Then you can come to such a locality, being a Warsaw professor, and teach those people. Now you have to learn this. Now you have to open a cultural center. Now you, you have to understand that you live in the borderland, not in the border uh, area. Why? Because, you know, I'm from Warsaw, I am this uh, old intelligentsia family. Uh, expert, I am cultured, I, I have been to the West, I studied this and that, and you are this provincial uh, ham. No, I, I cannot say ham, but this is what I will imply. You are this un, un, uh, uned, uned, uneducated peripheral uh, lower or middle class uh, uh, people. And in exchange, I can offer you this vision of New Silicon Valley, the dynamic economic growth, uh, etc. Uh, etc. And this division, which Kuczewska was promoting and others, is strongly related to the, to the much broader category, which was, you know, which is which was characteristic and still is in place, but for the entire post-communist period, in Poland, this, this not only in Poland, but most countries of the former Soviet communist bloc, the distinction between losers and winners, which was already criticized. Uh, by several authors, especially Michał Buchowski, the famous Polish an, an, an anthropologist. And uh, those winners are usually some kind of intelligentsia or competent, educated Poles uh, who knew how to take these opportunities, and those losers are those who are not able to take the, 
uh, use those opportunities. Uh, so in a way, I think this is a borderland peripheral version of this, uh, of this, of this, uh, this distinction, division, classification. Uh, so, so I see the borderland discourse as a compensatory uh, discourse. Again, this, this, is, this, this is my idea that cultural capital is a compensatory asset, in, especially in Poland, as uh, this peripheral, specifically, specific peripheral country of, of our region, but I think to, to some extent to in most of, the, of those countries. Maybe not so clearly as in Poland, in other countries, but, but, but it, it, this cultalization and uh, compensation with cultural ideas is, uh, is present in all those countries and borderland identity is one of those, uh, uh, one of those compensatory ideas, assets, discourses, uh, and, uh, and it fits very well into the new regionalism ideology, which, is, which was developing since like 30 years in the Western uh, Europe. Uh, and which emphasizes the uh, responsibility of the of, of, of the regions. This is new, the new new regionalism, which is basically an emphasis on the role of the regions, uh, in contrast to nation states, is promoted as this uh, uh, element of democratization and empowerment. Uh, uh, of, 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 of Western societies, but on the, other, on the other hand, as many critics show, has this neoliberal element, which uh, that is that it implies the restrictions of the uh, decrease of the responsibility of the state, of the social of the social responsibilities of the state for the inhabitants. So now the region is responsible for all your social needs. And if your region is not doing well, well, you have to blame the regional authorities. But basically, you have to blame yourself because you could change your region. Oh, well, it is difficult to change Ukraine or you know, country, but, but it's much easier to change Gal Galicia or uh, Lvivska uh, Oblast. So if you're not able to change even your local municipality, so you are to blame because you could, you could change your region into a borderland and it could become you know, a really successful uh, uh, part at least maybe a poor but country but a successful region of full country but if it's not successful it means you are responsible uh, uh, so uh, so it seems that there is this this supposed empowerment also has this downside hidden side of the of the responsabilization uh, moving uh, of this responsibility to to, 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 to citizens uh, from the state or the public institutions. Uh, uh, mm, and uh, so I said, to, this is here I'm summary, summary of this, this critique that it is a normative, largely normative uh, discourse which naturalizes relations of power and com com has a compensatory character and is related to this new uh, new, regional, new regionalism uh, uh, in, in which we are all responsible for our fate and there is uh, also an element of this important element new, new regionalism of the metaphor uh, of region as a corporation uh, which should you know, project its uh, interest uh, make have a business plan uh, and, uh, and 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 one of those identities of this mission statements that a region seen as a corporation can have is a borderland uh, uh, identity. So, so again, this responsabilization and uh, uh, and I think the problem with the borderland uh, uh, of of the borderland ideology of discourse is this marginalization of these wider dependencies, wider, wider global context. Borderland implies this focus on the region in supposedly you know, very positive idealistic assumption that now we should like give the voice to the local people and listen to the history, study the local histories instead of master narratives. 
but this is quite often at the cost of the understanding the place of the given region in this web of global uh, dependencies, relationship, which to large extent defines the fate of the given region. Especially, unfortunately, we can like it or not, but no, the, 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 peri the fate of periphery is usually decided outside the uh, periphery. And, and not understanding this doesn't allow really to understand what is happening in a given uh, locality. Quite often the crisis, all kinds of problems of the, of the places that we visit are not produced within those places. Are not, the sources are not local, but they are external. Uh, uh, so, so I also found some other critical studies not exactly of the Borderland discourse, but of this kind of, uh, uh, of, 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 of celebration of local identities, which could be related to new oriental, new, new, new regionalism, and especially Juraj Buzauka's study of uh, Polish-Ukrainian uh, Borderland, in which he is critically analyzing the new models of tolerance uh, promoted through European institutions and supposed to replace the traditional patterns of inter-ethnic, inter-faith uh, interaction in, in the region. And also another Michael Fleming study of, of which of users of the of the of the of the, of the discourses of uh, of uh, multicultural uh, ideas in which, in fact, to promote its economic. Uh, uh, no, no, liberal uh, uh, marketization. Uh, uh, so, so this is a problem. No, those kind of discourses uh, in uh, like borderlands that that by uh, ignoring, marginalizing the economic issues, sometimes they legitimize and indirectly economic you no know, changes, which may be seen in rather negative light, uh, things which uh, those critical scholars re relate to neoliberal uh, uh, phenomena. And uh, in all this game, what's important, I think, is already I mentioned partly that this is this hierarchy of the knowledge production, that, that we have this global centers with international experts, which usually produce theory, like this notion of borderlands and several other concepts that we use. Then we have national experts, teachers like me, <laughs> a Polish, Polish experts on uh, borderlands, which usually rely largely on the Western uh, scholars and uh, interpreters translating this reading Western books and spreading this knowledge in um, uh, local areas. Uh, especially in, 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 in regions, and then there are local lo local local experts. Local, you no, know, I am the Warsaw guy. So when I when I visit Lublin, Białystok, I am treated as this important scholar from uh, Warsaw. And to some extent, those local intellectuals, intelligentsia members, are my clients in a way because I am I am bringing this 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 knowledge which I get from my you know, visits and the uh, Western universities. And then there is this local population, which is an object, as I said here, symbolic, but also material uh, 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 domination. So this is, I think, the game of adaptation to those external influences. And, and this is what's important, it's the, 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 this is a cultural dimension. The, this, is, this is this hierarchy of knowledge production of, uh, Intellectuals, intelligentsia, especially in, in Poland, this is the intelligentsia people who are those national, regional, and local uh, experts, and they they play the game. They usually have some clear material benefits from engagement in this game, but this, these are not key economic stakes. Uh, par parallel to this, it's the economic. Uh, process, the dependencies, different economic processes which happen in these regions and which are usually ignored by this uh, culturally oriented uh, uh, experts. This is, I think, the problem that 
that most of the studies of the of the of the identities of the borderlands, those historical heritage, usually ignore really existing economic processes, especially though those more more negative. Uh, uh, sometimes there is even an interesting paradox that that those scholars are more interested interested in economic processes in the past historically than in than 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 than, than, than in contemporary uh, economic processes i think this is the especially quite visible in this uh, quite famous in poland book of jan sova which i mentioned yesterday this fantomowe ciało króla which is an aspiring study with the strong reliance as i said on, on this world system interpretations of polish history dependence of Poland critique of all this but 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 he focuses on the historic uh, aspect of economic dependence of Poland and completely while he while discussing the uh, contemporary Poland he's only discussing cultural uh, uh, issues uh, so uh, so again the same slide I showed yesterday that these two discourses can be contrasted that the Cressy discourse and Borderland discourse, although the Borderland discourse, as I said, usually the, 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 this, its, its, its ideologues define themselves in opposition to Cressy. They said Cressy is outdated, nationalistic, and it uh, should be gone. Uh, we should think about ourselves about, uh, as, as, as Borderlands, but you know, my provocative thesis is that there, is some, there are some common features because they have both these you know, as, as, uh, hidden assumptions uh, which are normative and which, which have this hierarchical nature that there's some, some you know, privileged regions, scholars, people and uh, some, some people who should adapt. In, in the class discourse this is uh, openly framed in national terms, religious terms, so, so, no, no, Ukrainians as uh, supposedly inferior to Poles. In, in Borderlands, this causes this uh, denial of this, but in fact you have those intelligentsia people who are competent uh, and you know, privileged, and the, the, the ordinary uh, non-educated people uh, who can have any nationality, but, uh, but still there is this strong, uh, uh, strong, uh, uh, strong characterization uh and uh, i can i think i can stop here because uh, the next part which i i, I can i i, I no, depend, i will give you now the possibility to comment but 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 anyway tomorrow or today maybe a few a few words uh, uh this will be my case studies from from eastern poland and how this borderland discourse is used uh, and especially in Białystok and uh, Lublin but but maybe I will let you know comment yes please very practical things, uh, especially in Ukraine during this decentralization process, this reform of decentralization. And I wanted to ask you, uh, exactly right yesterday I, I read uh, a text in Gazeta Wyborcza about the initiative which is called Zdecentralizowane RP. And uh, one of these activists of this initiative, he's uh, called Krzysztof Stanowski, he said that this idea is about, uh, so for, for many Ukrainian officials, uh, this uh, Polish model of uh, decentralization is quite, uh, it's quite applicable to the Ukrainian case. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, so, so they, are, they are trying to, to, to just, just enforce it in, in, the, in this Ukrainian process of decentralization. But uh, it's, I'm surprised that uh, Stanowski says that uh, Poland is still not uh, decentralized enough and mm -hmm. these regions, exactly Polish regions, are exactly very different, so they need more autonomy, for example, in education. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you think, uh, how do you think, uh, is it, uh, is he right? And uh, how, how do you think about this, uh, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know, internal uh, uh, discussion about whether uh, any country, much, uh, regions in any country much be, m must be uh, more independent of, or less independent because for, for, one, for one point of view, uh, they, uh, this, uh, 
uh, when they are more independent, they, they this could uh, lead to, 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 to strengthening of the state. From the other point of view, it could lead to separatist movement and to, 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 to complete crash of the state. What is your position? Ah, uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess I am aware of this initiative. I, I know several people who are uh, the authors, uh, initiators of this, and uh, in the Polish context, I am very skeptical. I am very critical, but the, 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 as you mentioned, uh, it all depends on the state. So it all depends on the on the context. So the, 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 the Poland is not Switzerland or Germany, and you know, and uh, and uh, and there are many other countries where the, those answers could be different, but. But in the Polish case, I am I am very skeptical, in particular about this project, and I think this this assumption that they make, or, or that what you mentioned about the success of the Polish so local reforms, democratization of the self-government, it's correct that, 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 that this 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 was a really a big success and uh, uh, and the generals. Uh, potential was mobilized. The local potential was mobilized because Poland immediately after the fall of communism, and this was a unique case that without a direct you know, pressure from Brussels or wherever, this was a really local initiative of the of the intelligentsia. In this case, a very positive role of the uh, Warsaw intelligentsia that they have the, during the communist period they were really drafting this laws of self-government, and this reform was introduced. In 1990, and we had you no know, immediately local elections, and most of those local governments are pretty successful, especially on the local level. Uh, but uh, but it the, the the but already on the regional level, it's more ambiguous because the the, the reform of the regional organization of structure of Poland was introduced in 1998 or 99. I, I will try to maybe discuss it uh, a bit in uh, tomorrow. Uh, and then what this project currently discussed in the Polish media is about is the, in fact, going in the direction of fed federalization of Poland. Although they deny, they don't want to use the, the, the word federal or federalization uh, because it doesn't, you know, Sounds convincingly in Poland, but this is the direction at least they want to go, and and I am I am very very skeptical about it. And uh, uh, first of all, because I see this problem, social problem of the you know responsabilization, as I said, that this assumes for me an increase of the social inequalities within the country, because much larger part of the social responsibility of the state will be moved to the to regions. So there will be this, you know, this, for me, this key problem that if your hospital won't be you know, able to help you, this will be basically the blame, you know, the regional authorities and you will be blamed because you, 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 you are not able to, uh, to choose to influence the uh, choice of the right go local government. So, so I am, I am skeptical about this uh, project. I see it as a no, negative case of this intelligentsia engineering, uh, trying to solve really deep problems of Poland by this kind of uh, regional game. And here again, I would, I would argue that the, the key problems of Poland are related to its position in the global economy. Dependent uh, 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 place, it's you no know, lack of capital, as I said, and uh, lack of advanced uh, industries, and and solving them through increase uh, federalization of country. It's, it's it's not not correct. They also, I think, overestimate the problem of the current political conflict in Poland. Because they say we are living in this terrible time of the uh, internal Polish war between liberals and conservatives, and it's unbearable. This war is destroying the country, so we should solve it somehow. So the solution is to divide the country by the, you know, uh, along those maps which I showed you on the first day. 
let's make these conservatives in the close them in the conservative regions, uh, isolate them, and let liberals live the normal European life. And, uh, and, and in this way, isolation will solve the problem. And first, I don't think that this is a big problem. I think this is very emotional. Uh, uh, but it's the, 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 this Polish political conflict is not bloody, and it really concerns rather silly, narrow uh, number of questions, not 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 fundamental. For example, economic is not not part of this uh, conflict. Uh, and and second, even if it's important conflict, this division of countries into conservative, this polarization kind of a, a Dutch old solution won't solve the, uh, the problem. Yes, Stephen? Uh, Tom, could you talk a little bit more about your point for the new regionalism and the new regionalism discourse uh -huh. about corporatization? So what I have in mind is, you know, back in the 90s in Yugoslavia, the discourse of failed states, mm -hmm. right? And, and in some ways, uh, I see like there's a, there's a sort of path from the 90s to the 2000s to the 2010s, because the discourse of failed states actually was kind of revived in referring to um, the pigs, you know, um, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, mm -hmm. Spain. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a moment with the economic crisis in 2007-8 Mm -hmm. where there was this great fear of Greece being a failed state and maybe others, including Ireland, being failed mm -hmm. states. So to, to what extent do you see this new regionalism, either federal or not federal, mm -hmm. as, a, as a kind of maybe compromise? I'm not sure if that's the right word, but there's, there's definitely a neoliberal framework to this. And the neoliberal framework is a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan potentially for regions that have to be kind of like managed from above. Um, I, I guess my question would be how, how promising do you see this new regionalism discourse at creating any kind of actionable economic co-border cooperation progress development? I, I mean, the failed state idea mm -hmm. is, is so important in Africa, right? Because you're, you're thinking about, you know, what, what to do with Namibia after Namibia fails. Or, mm -hmm. you know, even in the United States, what to do in the United States after the empire collapses. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are very few people who refer to the United States as a failed state, you know, like outside of the world of Noam Chomsky. But it, it, it's actually in many ways very true that, that Europeans are still kind of like holding on to these federal fantasies at the moment when it, federalism has, has largely, I think anyway, in my opinion, has failed as a project. So I, I, I guess I'm wondering how, how promising you see this new re regionalism discourse like switching into the next decade. We're going into the 2020s. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it just like completely asymmetrical dependency, neoliberals like, you know, trying to get tourists to come to some special borderland city, mm -hmm. or, or does it actually have some kind of promise of, you know, you see Silicon Valley as very negative, um, but there are smaller Silicon Valleys, you know, like little Silicon Valleys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, there, there's a kind of, there's a cycle of this discourse, right? Failed states of the 90s, mm -hmm. fantasies of federalism and the United States of Europe, like going back to Czartoryski, in, at least, or Masaryk, mm -hmm. in the 2000s with accession, and then the 2010s, which is like, you know, the brutal decade of illiberal democracy and dependency. Mm -hmm. But what, what next? I don't know. <laughs> What next? I think that the role of this new regionalism is the legitimization of those uh, brutal economic consequences of those you know, failures and exploitation. That this is the major role of the of new regionalism to 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 remove the blame for those failures. 
on uh, you know, from the, the dominant centers. I mean, the problem of Silicon Valley is not that it's developing so well, or uh, that that uh, it's not even that it's somehow uh, uh, dominating, but this, that its success is unique and almost unreproducible. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, it, it's it, it's almost impossible to 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 copy. Those few, few very successful states, regions, cities in the world exist because they have this global position and they benefit from this globalization. And, uh, and projecting the, them as examples to follow is simply false. And uh, this is, I think, to a large extent, the new region is based on this idealization of those few successful regions and cities sometimes in, in the in the world. But what will come next I don't I don't yeah. know. I mean Silicon Valley in US discourse right now uh, because of the, the the kind of turn against Google and, and Apple mm -hmm. and American oligarchs is is really negative. It's very, very negative. I mean more negative I think at this point in talking about Google than, than, and Zuckerberg and Facebook than ever before. Um, I, I mean, there, you know, Zuckerberg is now at that kind of like moment of antitrust and trust and trust busting. Um, he, he's seen as more of a robber baron um, and, and someone who's sort of like selling out the privacy of people who trusted the internet than ever before, at least in, in, my inter in, in my impression, seeing everything that's written about, you know, like breaking up the big, the big tech companies. And, you know, Silicon Valley is, is like, nobody can afford to live there. Like, but uh, I think we were... Yeah, I, 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 I am aware of this discourse critique, and, but, but I think it's very still distance, long way from for this critique to reach the mainstream of the regional development uh, textbooks and uh, all, the, all, all this theory. Still, when, when you, if you are you know, a local government leader and you want your region to have a nice development plan, you, you know, you, you invite a regional economist who tells you about the Silicon Valley as the model for you to follow. And, 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 and those critiques are you now not really still not yet taken into account by those in this international uh, you know circulation of knowledge about what does it mean to be a successful region successful regional economics maybe you know in decade or two if the silicon valley really collapses there will be some like detroit there will be some you no know, <laughs> reflection that well it is the, it is the next detroit actually but not i think not only you know not the <laughs> on its way maybe but not not okay. yet uh, so not yet obvious i think to yeah mm -hmm. um so you gave us the example of uh, polish belarusian border which is mm -hmm. kind of like closed uh -huh. and you said that the economic um, or the um business little business there just like kind of, kind of bugged it because of the closeness of the mm -hmm. border and on the other hand, you raised the question of uh, whether the investments of these like intelligentsia centers actually um, have some like positive impact for everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. So if you compare like this Belarusian Polish uh, border with Ukrainian Polish border, where the investments are usually uh, led to. Um, infrastructure, education, and other things. Don't you think that this like opening of the border and like this investments to have more fluent border border is actually leading to economic development? I, 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 I think so. But, but what is the question that uh, I would then? I think the opening of the border is you know, a very important impulse. Yeah, but for you raised the question about the investment, if it's actually like... But which investment? Like, no, external investment? What is the kind of investment? Yeah, yeah. maybe I misunderstood it, but uh, uh, I think that you said it like this. You raised like, the question if the investments 
from these intelligentsia centers if they actually affect the whole region positively or if there are just some who benefits from this investment. No, but my point was that intelligentsia is not interested in investment so much, no, in economic questions, that intelligentsia is interested especially this, you know, social scientists, scientists are interested in cultural processes and they completely ignore the or largely ignore the investments and questions of border economic exchanges. They they care about you know this development of this cultural centers, identity politics. This is what they when they arrive to Białystok they study how the Jewish culture it's used how the you know Tatar culture is visible or not, uh, to what extent Lithuanian influences are visible, but they are not not so much you know interested about who invests, where the capital comes from, and what was the effect of economic effect of the border closing. Sometimes they would notice that there is large outflow of migrants, you know, to the uh, Western Europe, but even not all of them. So um, you talked about um, more like Poles that Poles don't really like explore like Lithuania like on the border but mm -hmm. I think like talking about like Lithuanians I think they kind of like to explore this border in the way that they go like shopping <laughs> like grocery shopping but also mm -hmm. um, like clothes shopping and so on and I think I mean it's not I didn't do like any research or something this uh -huh. is my personal mm -hmm. um, uh, experience because I also went with some friends there. I have some friends who constantly go like every month or some people go like every week. Mm -hmm. So I have to confess that I once went without any documents. <laughs> it was like fine because it's so open. I think that border, at least it was at that time, was like two years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. So, so border, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, open. but I really heard that like Suwalki had a lot of like kind of like they start building like new shopping malls and so on uh -huh. and it got like more lively. I mean, it's basically for those like Lithuanian tourists coming mm -hmm. to buy things or mm -hmm. also maybe some Belarusians. But so I wanted to ask you about this kind of um, like investment. Would you see that Suwalki got like more like, do you see as them as like developing region because of this like coming in shopping or or not really? Mm, it's certainly you know, a positive development uh, and it's that, you know, no, uh, Lithuanian uh, adoption of euro, from what I was told, and uh, I am myself not economist, but uh, and, and I didn't study this, but I noticed that you know, as everywhere in Poland, most of the this retail, you know, the, most of the shop chains are Western owned. So, so I would, uh, you know, also. Um, Try to trying to answer the question. You know, try to see to, uh, which part of this you no know, income from this increase in trade stays in Poland and which uh, which goes goes abroad. Uh, Poland is like extremely unsuccessful in this retail uh, sector. That you know there is no Polish chain of stores, of whatever kind. Uh, no, it's I think Portu Portuguese. Uh, it was set up by a Paul, and uh, he came with this nice name, but then he sold immediately to, and it's it's the 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 the, the paradox that, that it's owned by this some uh, Portuguese company. I forgot the name, but it it exists from uh, 18th century or something like this. A family, for me, which is a very nice example of this. Uh, bourgeoisie which is largely you know based on this uh, several generations families and inheriting companies businesses in western europe especially german economies known for this uh uh clans uh, industrial uh, industrialists while in, in poland we don't have a single family which would you know have its business for more than 30 years. So, so Biedronka is in this, Martin, in this, no, in hands of this old bourgeois Portuguese family. And, and you, you know yourself that other 
there's also Żabka, which also sounds Polish, but it's not Polish, I think American or something like it. Uh, and all other names are less confusing. <laughs> uh, so this, I think this is an important aspect of this, this dependency, especially lack of capital, because I think the success of those chains is based on large capital, which that they, they, they're able to, you know, to buy and sell and, and, and large uh, amounts with, and, and, and Polish businesses are not able to invest this kind of uh, assets in trade. So they, uh, they, they, as I said, they, uh, Polish businesses are usually small or at least medium, maximum medium size and there's only a couple of the large state companies. Economical part. I really like your criticism on this idealistic post milosh understanding of borders as something creative, productive. Uh, that usually uh, very romantical way to uh, speak about borderlands populations and their uh, happiness, right? But <laughs> but uh, I really like your points about economy because in case when we are looking into ec economy of the trans-border mobility, the border populations, uh, it challenge more, I think, than cultural question, uh, contemporary border borderless Europe, right? Because uh, with, uh, not now it's open question for many European economists uh, how without borders uh, any country or you could localize any economical or social problem, so they are becoming tran transnational, uh, and um, and so on this border that you are talking about. So, for example, when you have EU e EU EU border between po Pol Poland and Lithuania, so how uh, how economical part of uh, of this border looks in terms of localization of economical challenges, crises, social uh, problems. Because, for example, Thomas Feist uh, from Bielefeld, he produced this idea of tra uh, transnational social question, uh, transnational social uh, question. And uh, so he is saying that we destroyed political borders in terms of line between countries, but in, uh, at the same time productive uh, and other borders in, inside of countries, between classes, between social groups, between economical zones. So, and in your cases, uh, how you see this economic side of the story and uh, how border now affected localization of these economical problems and challenges? I think the, the main uh, issue is the migration, which I mentioned that, that, that most of the problems of both on Lithuanian side and on the Polish side were solved uh, uh, by, by large migration flows to the Western Europe. I think Lithuania lost even more the higher share in inhabitants than Poland. But, but those regions, Podlasie on the, on the Polish, Ukraine, Belarusian and Lithuanian borderlands, were also known as, as very early even uh, regions where the migration to the West started very early in the in, in, in 90s uh, already. And uh, there are a lot of villages which lost a large, very large amount of inhabitants. And some of them like commute, move uh, back and forth. So, so the, the interesting studies of those villages were there's a uh, link with specific Belgian or Dutch uh, cities is uh, uh, identified. That people in Monkey, in Podlasie go to Brussels and, and this started in early 90s and, and, and really to a large extent so maybe not destroyed but considerably weakened the social structure of, the, of those cities and it's uh, largely silenced silenced uh, problem and then there was also partly mitigated by those West EU structural funds that Eastern Poland you know, is a beneficiary of this 
especially they were increased after we joined the EU of this Western funds, that they are, in fact, compensation for this marginalization. This is a payment for, for the loss of the large part of the population and for this economic marginalization after the closing of the border, which is usually not directly you know, mentioned. This is, this is not the way the EU or the government presents these payments to the, to, to, to the region as the compensation for all these losses. But, but, but I think because of the migration and those subsidies from the increased subsidies for the, especially the eastern regions, the economic crisis is not so visible. Uh, especially when you visit those places, you don't see poverty, open, open poverty. The, 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 the buildings look more or less normal. Uh, but but when you look at the no, really social indicators, things are not so optimistic. And so this is uh, and this con seems to confirm this you no know, transformation on things spatial into rather social and those 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 prob probably those problems like translate into the increased inequalities both in Poland and within those Western countries, like England especially, maybe Norway, where large migrant populations from Eastern Europe exist, function sometimes you know, in really bad conditions. 